welcome back. Okay, so today we're going to talk a little bit about field recovery, and that is how do we find these things in the first place? When we know that something's happened, how do we identify where a, a grave that's hidden or a body that's somehow out in the field, how do we find it? And after we do find it, what do we do? How do we deal with when we find something in what we call in the field, which really means it could be anywhere. It doesn't necessarily mean a field. It means it could be found in a building, in a basement, in a garage, in a house, in a car, in a drainage ditch, uh, in a swamp, whatever. So what we're going to talk about today is those methods that we use and why we use them. Let's get started. This is a wordy slide, I know. Most of my slides, I promise, will have pictures uh, for the most part, and this one is one of the one of the most wordy. But in a perfect world, field recovery uh, should follow archaeological procedures. That is, what we learn from archaeologists, how to get the data from a scene. These things are really important. If you remember back in the very first talk we had, Every time I remove those bodies from where they were found, we lose the context of that scene. We lose what position they're in, who's on top of what, what's around them, in what conditions they were found. Thorough mapping and photographing before messing with anything, before picking anything up. Yes, we will get more information from the skeletons after we bring them back to the lab. We can subject them then to different scientific experiments with uh, instruments that we can only have in the lab. But remember, we're losing all of that contextual information if we pull them out of the ground. So before we do, we want to basically preserve as much as we can. So we use photographs, drawings, a lot of notes, all kinds of things before we pull anything up out of the bottom, out of the ground. We set what's called a datum point. Datum is singular for data, so what that is is where all of those data are going to be drawn from. In other words, a fixed point from whence we can measure all the rest. So we want to measure how far a knee is away from uh, our datum point, and then we can measure how high, how low, all those things are associated with the datum point. It is a point, this is something we learned directly from archaeology, it's a point in space that we can then measure everything off from and get relative positions of everything. Then we can reconstruct it in computers, all kinds of things. So we have to set that datum point using all sorts of GPS, we have to understand the altitude, the uh, exact position, it has to be dead level, so we use a plumb bob usually, all sorts of things. Then methodical recovering of, of the remains. We've got to know exactly where this bit came from and everything. And it's not all remains. Also, keep in mind murder weapons, um, objects, identification, um, goods that the person owned, like earrings or bracelets or anything. All of those things can help play a part, a very important part in a lot of cases, in this particular forensics. Uh, investigation. So methodical recovery, meaning everything's marked, everything's labeled, everything is cataloged in such a way that we can find it, find it easily and quickly, and know exactly what we're working with. Securing the remains for transport, of course, they have to be protected so they don't get more damaged. Furthermore, during the field recovery, we've got to make sure that we don't damage the remains. Now, this happens a lot where something gets damaged when they're exhuming the body or even when they're searching to try to find the body. Um, more than likely, one of the most famous ones that you guys may know about is when Richard III's body, which was just recently found in a Leicester uh, parking lot uh, in, in northern England, um, they accidentally hit his skull with a pickaxe. Of course, he had a lot of damage because he was the last British king to die in battle. He was killed with medieval weapons, and there was a lot of bashing and slashing going on. But the the fact that somebody hit it with a pickaxe when they were recovering the body, luckily, 
luckily, it's very easy to see that new damage. And remember, I told you the difference in the bone and how it reacts with perimortem versus postmortem versus premortem damage. This is very postmortem, so we knew for sure that it was caused by the exhumation and not by the mutilation of his body after he died. And then finally, as I mentioned in the very first episode, following a chain of custody. Chain of custody means I have custody over these bones at all times between this time and that time until I hand it off to another investigator and say, okay, I'm handing these bones to you. They mark down what their name is, when I gave them the bones, and I relinquish the bones and sign off on that. This is extremely important because, again, this is a forensics case. This is an active case. We have to be extremely diligent about who has custody of what, when, so that if anything goes weird in court, we can explain that very quickly or uh, know who's, under whose jurisdiction it was. Well, obviously, to find human remains, first thing we have to do is locate them, right? The most well-established and absolutely least expensive, most rewarding, in my mind, and also, most importantly, the most effective way of locating human remains is still good old cadaver dogs. These are dogs who are trained to smell this peculiar scent, uh, which is made up of a myriad of chemicals, which cause, which is caused by human decay. And they can differentiate between human decay and decay of any other animal. Of course, there's all sorts of other methods that were created uh, by science to try to replicate what dogs are capable of doing. Uh, remote sensing methods such as ground penetrating radar, that's GPR, Conductivity, which is soil conductivity, where you kind of put two probes into the ground and see if they're, it's more conducive than other areas of the ground, which will tell you there's moisture in there, which may be a body. And, of course, sonar, which is kind of like radar, only using sound waves, to understand what's under the ground. But let me tell you, GPR, conductivity, and sonar, none of those give you an actual picture of what's – it's not like an X-ray. What we're actually doing – and if you ever look at a readout, it's either a bunch of numbers or a graph that shows where that disturbance is and gives you a rough idea of the size. That's about it. It does not tell you whether it's definitely human or not. And our dogs can absolutely do that. Feature analysis, soil disturbance, coloration, plant growth, all sorts of other little things like a depression in the ground, which we'll talk about one by one. Um, will give us a fair, fairly good idea of whether or not it's the right size, shape, and place for there to have been a body that was buried. Again, our good old friends, the dogs, can be extremely helpful for any other scattered remains. What happens more often than not, somebody will go under their house or under the porch or into their dog's house, the dog house or something like that, a place where a dog frequents, and they're gonna and they go in there and they're like, "What is what is uh, Max doing?" And then they find a human bone. Oh my God, my dog's a murderer! No, what's happened is dogs, of course, really like bone, especially fresh bone with gushy bits on it, uh, because they really like gnawing, chewing, and tasting the delectable delights of rotting flesh. <laughs> so oftentimes. A dog will bring a, a present home for themselves, or you know, a little, a little um, trophy, and they'll play and chew and do all kinds of things with it for a while, and then the dog's parent finds it and goes, uh, "Okay," calls the authorities. Authorities come out, and what do we do? We watch the dog. Dogs are really into routine. So they've got an area sort of that they will, they will do their patrol every day. You basically follow the dog, and generally they will lead you to the rest of the body. Uh, it's not hard to find usually using the dog in such a capacity. 
they're extremely helpful and dogs are amazing their sense of smell their ability to get at stuff that is either uh, shallowly buried or right on the surface they will always find it if it's in their domain uh, as I mentioned I've mentioned this quite a few times but this believe it or not is what an evidence bag looks like a lot of people think oh an evidence bag must be some locked container like a steel little box or something like that. nope it is a paper bag <laughs> with this printed on the side um, the evidence bag will ask for certain details of the agency, et cetera, et cetera, uh, who's dealing with it, uh, the date and, and things like that. But then down below, the important part and the main reason I'm showing you this is the chain of custody. You see it down below. Um, it's usually only going through about two or three different groups of people. So usually they will be picked up by the officer or detective that's assigned to the case they will bring that to either ourselves or the medical examiner and then the other will hand it off to the third at the end so usually it goes officer medical examiner anthropologist and then back into the evidence uh, locker so there's usually only those three uh, occasionally they'll go through more and if so they will either and uh, clap on another rider that's uh, usually stapled to the bag or put it in another bag because to be honest after we've opened and closed the bag several times usually there will be the top will either be taped or often more often than not stapled closed just with a couple of staples like folded over stapled uh, just to maintain its um, its integrity as an evidential uh, untampered with uh, sample obviously for the most part this is plenty uh, most most cases aren't scrutinized nearly as much as something like the OJ Simpson case or something like that but it is I, I, I laugh about these things because there, there's clearly room for improvement but I'm here to tell you the money that would be involved with a more intensive way of securing evidence and things like that really probably is not worth the effort um, and pr it probably won't happen anytime soon another thing um, a butterfly puddle oh butterflies how cute a lot of people don't know this about butterflies <laughs> Butterflies are very attracted to the juices that ooze out of a decomposing body. Butterflies do not have a mouth. Butterflies lick all of their sustenance after they turn into a butterfly. They, they do all their eating when they're a caterpillar, and then they do all of their drinking, really. And the only way they pick up sustenance is through a tongue, basically. That comes out of a proboscis so um, butterflies are attracted to where a corpse is buried so if we see a slight depression and there's a whole bunch of butterflies now all butterfly puddles don't mean there's a corpse there oftentimes it's just a damp part of the soil and butterflies are attracted to that too because they're also drinking but if we see butterfly puddling in an area where we're looking for a body Mm, there's a pretty good chance we're going to do some digging over there to try to see if we can find the body thanks to our friends the butterflies who also have a pretty fantastic sense of smell finally after we find a body using whatever method we do although as I mentioned cadaver dogs are by far the most uh, reliable we will then have to secure the crime scene. This is extremely important. I don't care how many TV shows show you different, where Lucifer and uh, detected like D.I. Jones and the uh, Murder She Wrote or Miss Marple or all the people who can just walk in to a crime scene and wander about. Not true. Truth is, it is very well policed and secured. You can't walk into a crime scene any easier than you can walk into the county jail and just walk around and do your thing. You can't do it. 
it is very secure. We will almost always put at least one or maybe more uniformed officers on scene. They have to sit there 24 hours a day and babysit that place until everybody's done with what they do. Also, another thing that's going to ruin TV for you again, I'm sorry, you guys, but it's just sort of my job. <laughs> it, i, I got to admit, it's not a part of the job I don't like. I kind of like ruining TV shows. But anyway, um, is if a body is discovered in the middle of the night, guess what? We don't bring a whole bunch of lights and light the area up and swarm on the area in the middle of the night to try to recover stuff. Never would we do that unless there's some other reason that we have to do it immediately, like there's a flood coming or something. We will wait for daylight. We'll get out there early, but it will be daylight because false light always comes from a very finite source. You will miss a lot. In fact, we usually come back to the scene quite a few times for maybe a week or more in some cases we will return to the scene looking for anything else we can uncover so the scene is protected then we will come back during the day and do our field recovery we'll try to get it done as quickly as possible usually it's done fairly quickly within a day or two unless it's a very complex scene or there's a lot going on uh, occasionally we will return to a site even months later and it, of course it wasn't secured that whole time but usually it'll be we'll get everything back if it's a main area like this you see this is a park or some sort of a field we'll find it then if it's a swamp or the middle of the woods or something like that the scene will not be as well maintained after the initial um, recovery has been done there are a lot of problems with forensic field recovery. More of the skeleton uh, that is recovered, the better chances of an identification and a manner of death. Remember, manner is not the same as cause of death can be determined. Removal is a destructive process. It can only be done once, and once it is removed, we lose all the context. So most of the time, we will do it fairly quickly. We will get as much information as we can because, of course, time is always of the essence when you're working for something like this. But there's a lot of things that we do to try to solve these issues, these initial issues. Training courses and involvement of all on-call anthropologists in those training courses, meaning having people be trained. This is first responders, not the anthropologists, trained in what we're doing and why we do it. In other words, telling cops, hey, don't walk around in the field of recovery. Mark it off, find something, back off. Get out of the crime scene, close it off, put crime tape around it, and guard it. Call it in, get the team out there. That's how it works. They are trained not to touch, not to lift. This is another one that you always see on those TV shows. The detective will come in, take take out their pen out of their pocket and lift something up in a crime scene. Never, ever happens. If they do that, they have just basically taken that piece of evidence out of the viable, useful pool of things we can use to collect DNA, to collect fingerprints, to collect anything. They've just ruined the integrity. Plus, they've changed the position of it. If they do that, they ruin the crime scene. This is the aspect of contamination that I was talking about. Walking around, even just walking through a crime scene, now you've put footprints there or obscured footprints that may have been left by the killer. It may have been evidence that you just stepped on or evidential things like blood drops which could be picked up by the foot, carried away. We'll never see it. It's on the bottom of a cop's shoe now. So the point is, the field is an extremely, we've got to keep it like laboratory tight in a crime scene. 
Slow, methodical field recovery pro procedures are extremely important. You want to take your time, see what you're seeing, and record literally everything. Controlled deconstruction. We've seen this picture before. Remember, this is our mass grave picture. Um, controlled deconstruction is extremely important. What you want to do is slowly, working from those datum points. Um, in this case, here we go. We've got this woman here is taking a measurement from the datum point, which he's holding, to the cross uh, point. They, we don't always do this, but oftentimes, if we're looking at a grave, we will. If it's just a point recovery on the surface, we won't do this. But in most grave recoveries, especially if there's more than one body, we will absolutely start laying out grids and start taking measurements from a datum point. This third individual is working with a line level, making sure this line is dead level so that this line is level so that her measurement is proper. Then eventually they may measure from this point down to this top of the knee in this case, or the pelvis or the skull. These are all extremely important aspects of how to bring these things up. The last thing we will usually do is pull that body off from the ground after we've uncovered it. Setting a datum point often revolves around utilizing various tools of the field. This is a total station that these two gentlemen are working with. And from that, the grid, which is laid out usually with string, as we saw in the last photo, uh, across the grave area or the recovery site. And then all the datum points are drawn. Now, usually we don't do this with surface recovery. We will usually do this with a burial. The other thing we tend to do with this grid in place is we will do what's called pedestaling the bodies. That is, the skeletons you see here, and we've dug around and down, but we've left the body in place, held up by all the soil that has to hold it in place, and we've dug around it to get all of the information that we need. But then the very last thing, as I mentioned before, is going to be the removal of the skeleton itself. Once we remove that skeleton, we lose all of its context as far as the positioning and everything else it's going to go away. So we want to record that as well as we can. We also, as I mentioned, will do drawings. The drawings will include information usually like a scale, the datum point, which in this case is probably centered in the tree. No, it looks like apparently we took a different datum point. Oftentimes, um, depending on what we're working with, here they've got the datum point starting here. But oftentimes we'll use an object or the corner of a building, something that doesn't move, like a tree, and we'll use that as the datum point to measure off from. Some people don't like using trees, and it's valid, because the tree has a circumference. You're not getting a very exacting datum point. So oftentimes they will opt to do an artificial datum point using the total station, which will tell you that you're plumb and where you are, and using GPS and everything else, give you an exact datum point to measure from. Then we will not only concentrate on the body, but also things, objects that go along with it, shoes, cigarettes, uh, beer bottles, coins, knives, whatever, a gun. Obviously, these things can play a part in telling the whole story. There's also other data. We will record, for example, if it's on a slope. Here we've got a slope which goes down from this datum point downward, which explains the skull, the skull fragments. All these things would be moved downhill because they tend to roll very well. So the skull probably would roll down. Now here you see the angle of the slope. You guys see this? The angle of the slope and the degree of the slope. So the slope is at 19 degrees going this way which makes sense, 90 degrees, pretty steep slope. That would be why the skull has moved all the way down here. Okay, this is not recording the slope. The slope is associated with this part here. This 
is recording. Any idea? Anybody looked at a map lately? That is pointing due north. Usually we will go ahead and line up due north, magnetic north anyway, uh, because that's important. There's also a legend down here, which is telling you their baseline, their datum point. Here's the baseline. Here's the datum point. This is what they're measuring from, right? Does that make sense? From the datum point and the slope and everything else, the rock, and most of the other things that are important, like C1, C2, those are cervical vertebra. That's neck vertebrae, which, of course, have also, boom, boom, they're, they're starting down that slope. So the skull, skull fragments made it the furthest. The skull fragments, being that they're as far down here as the skull, tells us that possibly this is post-mortem. Perhaps this fragment was either broken loose or the skull had skin on it when it rolled down here and then the skin rotted away and boom, allowed the fragment to fall away and further down the slope. It's usually what we're working with. So. We're utilizing physics, common sense, good old detective work, and all of those things play a part in how we're reconstructing these sites. Field tagging, this is where you're looking at surface disturbances, things that might play a part. It's not always a guarantee. Usually, in this situation, we're using volunteers, helpers, uh, students, things like that are usually the part that th they usually play a big part in doing this. You can see they're wearing um, uh, lower body pants, basically, which are usually Tyvek or paper. They've got gloves. They're all wearing head covering. And they also, we usually do this, are wearing some sort of covering for their arms. Now, if it was Cooler weather, and they were all wearing shirts, shirt sleeves. We wouldn't worry about this so much. However, in hotter weather, we'll go ahead and cover up their bare arms. This is, of course, in order to avoid any contamination. Again, uh, we'll also you'll also notice that they're they're wearing on their feet these little feet coverings, these booties that kind of cover over. They're they're just a, a paper material, usually the same material that the pants are made out of. You see these little blue booties down here that she has over her um, shoes, which is also very important, again, for contamination. Remember how I said if you disturb something and then carry something away on the bottom of your shoe, it's a problem. Well, these booties would then be put into a container. All of their pants, booties, their gloves, and their forearm covers would be put into a bag and then inspected when we get back to the lab to make sure that nothing got carried away on any of those things. Here's my friend John Verano. He's working. Uh, this is actually a much older grave site, but it shows you uh, the type of removal that we're doing. It's very meticulous. This is to avoid things like a pickaxe head blow, uh, like we talked about with Richard III. We're avoiding damaging any of these bones in any way because that could be mistaken for something. We don't want to do that. So in this case, he's using a chip brush to, to sweep away the loose soil. Uh, here's another brush down here over by his forearm. A wider brush. This is a narrower brush. He's working his way around, removing that loose stuff. When we get into tougher soils, uh, compacted muds, clays, that kind of thing, then we might get a trowel out and slowly work that surface down. But I mean, I'm talking, we're going millimeters at a time. Oftentimes, people will stay the hell out of the grave. So what we will do is we will clearly mark the outer rim of the area that we call it, that we think is of importance and work our way down. Again, this is a much older recovery. This isn't, um, it probably wouldn't be forensics. It would be more like paleopath, but it's the same thing. You can see again, they're working with very small tools, usually paint brushes. This is a trowel here. They're working very, very, very slowly. Again, you'll notice they're completely. This is what, what I was talking about earlier with pedestaling. This is 
taking these and working down around but not disturbing the bones. This is the lower the bones of a lower leg here. This is a, a right leg, if you're curious. Uh, we've got a tibia and a fibula. And what we're looking at is slowly working our way around and down, not disturbing the bone until the very last minute. Screening all of the soil and everything else. This is a, a typical field recovery routine where we take all of the dirt that we're removing from on top of the grave and sift it. We use a sifting, this screen here would usually be maybe a quarter inch or eighth inch uh, openings in the screen, kind of like chicken wire. And what we're doing there is making sure that we get all the fragments of bone. Usually we will keep even all of this soil in case we need to go through it and see if and try to find something we missed. All the small bits and fragments get individually tagged. Oftentimes we'll bag it in a little baggie and put a unit area in which we found it, the distance from the datum point and which square it came out of and what depth it came out of. We do a search area around the body. Uh, there are a lot of different ways to do it. We can either do a grid search or a spiral search, which is what this image is showing you, where we would start at the body and kind of wind our way around. Obviously, spiral searches are if we don't have as many personnel. If we've only got one or two people, we'll go ahead and do a spiral search. If we've got a group of people, we will police the area in a grid search where we would line up on one edge and walk straight across and then turn to the other edge and go straight across. Everybody just finding anything or, t or putting a flag, as we saw earlier, anywhere that we see something that might be associated. The main reason we would do these things is a long post-mortem interval, meaning after the body's been laying there for a long time. So we've got animal scattering and of course scene contamination by all sorts of different things. Not enough money or resources for a long recovery. This is that we have to get it done quickly, which is mostly what's what we're dealing with. Uh, so we do a pattern search, like a spiral or grid search. We do an aerial search. If we're lucky and we can fly, uh, we'll do that. Or we'll look around the area as quickly as we can using whatever methods we have, either on foot, on horseback, on uh, four-wheelers, whatever to try to look and see what we can see. Uh, boats even, in some cases, uh, in, in the case of like a swamp scene or something. Returning multiple times to locate missing things. I mentioned this before. We tend to go back and say, you know, we never did find its, uh, the, this uh, decedent's hyoid bone, for example, which is a bone in the neck, which can indicate things like strangulation. Forensic field recovery, uh, can also be problematic when we're dealing with mass graves. Mass grave is technically a grave that holds five or more individuals. Remember MNI. Five or more individuals can be difficult <laughs> to deal with because now you're dealing with commingling of remains. People have usually gone through this. In this case, this is a, this is an image from Bosnia Herzegovina uh, warfare that was going on with uh, Macedonia and, and what we're looking at here, I think it's Macedonia. What we're looking at here is a mass grave. We've usually, these things have already been disturbed often by families looking for loved ones. All sorts of things can go on, especially in a war zone. Um, so these are really difficult to deal with. Usually need heavy equipment. You can see it in the background. There's a, there's a literally an earth mover back there and almost always have to use a large group of people. We need a lot of help on things like this. Uh, they never look like this, <laughs> not in my experience, especially war graves, things like that are always just everything's mucked about because people have been in there messing about. Uh, this is one of the sites where people were lined up and killed, usually uh, an entire village or something like that. We saw an awful lot of this in World War II. Uh, we see this in most situations where uh, there is a, we're looking at genocide. 
uh, we see this in ethnic cleansing kind of a thing. It's pretty horrifying. They usually look quite more like this, just a, a, a mangled mess of bone. And our job is to determine who's whom and get them all of their bones back together in one place and then return them to the families so that the family can have closure. These can obviously be a very, very prolonged case, may last years or more, where we're trying to figure out through any means we have, DNA or simply osteometrics, trying to determine who's whom and get them together and then return them to their family. Again, mass grave layouts. Now we have an even larger uh, grave map, like what we saw before, uh, where we're laying out all of the bodies in their positions and generally keeping a pretty good idea of what uh, components are there. If you draw out each one of these things on this grid, let's say you're working methodically and you're going from left to right or something like that, north to south, whatever. And you're working this area, and you keep finding more and more elements, right? So you're working your way across. Well, you may miss things. And then when you see this overall view, you can figure things out. For example, if we have a lone leg here, and right beside it, to the north of it, we have an individual missing a leg. Oh, hey, that probably belongs to this guy. And then we can start doing measurements and seeing if it's pretty close to the uh, obverse leg, the opposite leg, and then we can start to see things. Sorry, I meant contralateral, not obverse. Primary and secondary burials are also an issue here. This would be a classic primary burial where the bodies are pretty much where they fell. And in situ, you can see nothing's been disturbed here. But if somebody digs these up and then throws them into another pit or another area or somewhere else for all sorts of things, it can be grave robbing, it can be looking for a, a loved one and just pushing other things out of the way or whatever, that can be called a secondary burial. These things can happen for a lot of reasons, including religious reasons, and we have to keep all that stuff in mind. Temporary morgues set up at or near a gravesite are very common these days, especially in the case of a mass disaster. For example, a natural disaster like Katrina or uh, a tornado or an earthquake or a massive mudslide or something like that where a lot of people die, then there's usually a uh, temporary mortuary set up where we'll do exactly what I've been talking about, trying to identify who's, who belongs to whom and which components go with what. We will often put a lot of medical materials in there. We'll put a DNA scan in there if we have the facilities to do so. In these pictures, you can see basically the size of these things. They're usually uh, a temporary structure, or sometimes they will go into a warehouse or something that already exists there and is not being used. They're usually broken up into separate spots, so we have zones for various things. They'll lay that out usually with tape if there's ground to work with. And then we'll set up tables, autopsy tables, and then we'll set up different labs. Like this person has an entire lab, probably looking uh, microscopically or even histologically at things. Over here we'll have where we're kind of lining things up, categorizing table, that sort of thing. 